<laughs> there is no gentleman except you and me. <laughs> now, I would like to talk about the relationship between oral and written codes, and I will take some examples of uh, audiovisual translation as a basic of my talk, but I will give you simple remarks. And then I will raise a simple problem, so I will try to, do, to deal with the simple problems, I will ask you at the end a simple question, but I have no clear answer. And I would like to discuss about that with you. What? So simple remarks, simple problems, simple questions, but a very delicate and uneasy answer, if there is any answer. Simple remarks. Uh, usually in translation studies, we have been working with a very simplistic dichotomy between oral and written. Translation for written forms and interpreting for oral forms. Even if we know that, for instance, you can interpret things which are based on the written text and read text. Okay? But on the other hand, when we do this kind of simplistic dichotomy, we forget a lot of different type of transformation or modality of translation, like sign language interpreting, sight translation, and the different modalities of audiovisual translation, what we, what we have been looking yesterday, like audio description, and live subtitling. So the, the dichotomy between oral and written forms are two symbols if we want to cope with different forms of translation today. And the same dichotomy exists or has been existing for a long time in linguistic too. So in a way, in translation studies, we have been reproducing something which was inherited from a different field, another field. And, but on, on the other hand, very quickly, when we deal with translation, we have to acknowledge some kind of problems because we know that when we translate a novel, we have some different type of orality in the novels because of dialogues or because of different colloquial or dialectal variations in the novels. And if I now refer to retranslation of certain Russian authors like Dostoevsky in French, we realize that what we consider as a masterpiece in written form based mainly on oral form of Russian. So even if it's a literary piece, it's mainly based on oral forms. And another retranslation which has been uh, taking place not long time ago, it's Hegel, the German philosopher, which has been retranslated in, uh, in, uh, in French. And the first translation was really a written traditional form. And now we re when we read, reread his text, we realize that they were oral, more conference form than written form. So what we read now, when we read Hegel again, it's completely a different type of so-called text. Okay? And then, if you look at the, if you consider the interface between orality and uh, um, how could we okay, writing in African literature, in European languages, you, you also face the dilemma of the there is no dichotomy between written form and oral form. It's they are both integrated. And uh, so far that for a long time, this has disturbed the tradition in France because what the way they were writing in French from African literature was considered to be petit nègre. And this has been for a long time. That was the representation of the language we gave about literature from Africa. Even if it was written form, we consider it as something secondary or not valuable because it was more oral form. And you have uh, example, for instance, in uh, Tintin in Congo, when you read how RG has been trying to express the way African were speaking French or writing French. And even uh, in songs, I remember one of the old songs of Edith Piaf in 90s, 39, I think, I don't remember the title, of the, I have it somewhere here, uh, Voyage du pauvre nègre, and if you read the lines of the, the songs, 
she tried to imitate what she considers the way the people were writing and speaking in Africa. And she said, for instance, moi pas vouloir quitter pays. Typical stereotype or representation of some kind of talk in French from Africa. Now, if we consider, for instance, verbal folklore between orality and literacy, you have also to consider that verbal folklore is delivered orally, but before you translate, you have to textualize the text. And you have quite interesting cases in Arabic, but I'm thinking now also, because I read an article about that not long time ago, about Irish narratives, which are very strongly marked by oral tradition. And how can you translate these oral features in German and in French when the tradition is more on the literary aspect of so-called narrative? And now if I give you, uh, again, my problem is uh, my remarks are always thinking about is there any dichotomy between oral and written, okay? And if you think about translating theater plays for dramatic performance, you have to consider keywords or concepts like speakability. And then it means you cannot write the text as you do only when you read. It has to be speakable. You have to think about actability, so the words are also in the body of the actor. And you have to think about singability if there is any singing uh, play, piece in the, in the play. But this is quite, make people quite uneasy in some respect. And they always feel that theater dialogues feel or is unnatural. But unnatural compared with what? And this is uh, even today, if you think about dubbing, some people think, even if they are used to dubbing, they feel very uneasy with dubbing because they realize or they pretend it's artificial. But again, artificial compare with what? In relation with what? Do you compare dubbing with impromptu conversation, daily conversation, or do you uh, compare dubbing with natural language, with what? And they say when you ask them, why is it so artificial for you? Why is it so unnatural? Well, they try to define and say there is a lack of idiomaticity. I think the question is a little bit, it goes a little bit further than that, but I have no, I would not like to discuss that. But the question is, what is the relationship between what you say in a dialogue in the theater what you say in a dialogue for films and what you say in uh, daily interaction. And I think this is quite important because this is very old questions which has been raised 2,000 years ago by Aristotle about very similitudes, realism in arts and literature and representation. If you do representation of dialogue in films and in theater, it does not mean that you have to copy what's going on in daily life. So my point is, I don't believe that there is a dichotomy between written form and oral form, but there is some kind of continuum, okay? And I don't think we make any progress in translation studies or in linguistics if we try to make these two categories so apart. Okay, for me, I think this is, uh, there is a co constant interplay between written form and oral form. You follow me? It's very simple. I told you it will, there will be simple remarks. Now I come to my problem, which is also simple. So far for the remarks, okay? I become aware of the fuzzy norms of the written form when I have noticed in, uh, in corpus linguistic that you can find out in corpus expressions, idioms, words I have never heard. Why not? I mean, I don't pretend to know everything of one language or two languages. But they have been recorded just because they have occurred once in a chat <coughs> or in a discussion on the internet. And you record everything. Okay, and you, you, you have few examples like that in corpus linguistic. And then I realized 
For instance, uh, I give you a French example. Instead of au fur et à mesure, you have only au fur de in chat discussion. I never heard about this, but it's recorded in corpus linguistics. You can find it now. And then I was wondering, okay, this exists. It has been used by some people. Why not? It exists, and it is recorded not in dictionaries. I don't teach it as an expression in my class, but I don't use it, but it has been used. Okay, fair enough. Now the question is, so, what kind of norms do we use when we do subtitling? What kind of norms, written norms, do we have to use when we write any kind of subtitling? And again, I realized that a few years ago to say, well, don't worry, you can use smileys, you can use uh, emoticons, you can use abbreviation, you can use uh, pictogram, whatever you want. That's the way the young people use the language on the chat, chat, SMS, and uh, in some kind of, sometimes in blogs. All right, fair enough. The language can change, and there are language variations. And I think this is quite uh, easy to understand and even to accept. SMS, chats, and emails are showing some change of attitudes to uh, language norms, and uh, I think that's the way the language are uh, living languages. I will not talk about net speak and the uh, linguistic features of uh, net speak because you know, I suppose, most of these features how we use capital, capital letters, how we use uh, abbreviation, and so on, and uh, how we use, uh, forget to use prepositions, for instance, uh, in English, and so on, which is, uh, by the way, the nightmare of the teachers in my institute nowadays, because the students don't want to use preposition in English. Well, okay, fair enough. And you delete articles, and you use the verb in a certain way, and so on. There is also a certain paradox, because is this trying to expand if this kind of language is used more and more? If tomorrow I use it for a subtitling, there is a kind of contradiction because there is no norms, no conventions. I can write, there is nobody telling me that you should avoid this and that. I can write SMS as I want. I can use any kind of abbreviation as far as the other one understand me. So this is a language, but on the other hand, there is no standardization of that language, not yet anyway. And then, let's proceed a little bit. In the last few years, there have been thrillers in France published in SMS language. My question is very simple. How can you understand SMS language if there is no norms? So it means that people can uh, write the thrillers in different ways. But not only thrillers, novels. And last year I gave the example of the city of Montreal who use three type of uh, three websites. And one of them is what they call in orthographe facile. So they don't make any difference between written form and oral form for a simple reason. They believe, or they not only believe, they strongly know that one-third of the population of the city is more or less illiterate. How can you inform these people if they watch and try to read a little bit of in a website if the orthograph is too complicated? So they decided to use orthograph facile, what they call orthograph facile. And the last example I would like to give you is a European constitution which has been translated in SMS in France and was very largely distributed in 2005. And again, people were fascinated when the man who translated that because he was, <coughs> sorry, he was an MP against the European constitution. So in a way, he was more effective to talk to young people with this SMS translation than people, politicians who try to convince people to vote yes or no for the constitution. That's the problem. What do we do with these kind of languages? 
My question is also simple. <clears throat> and I'm asking you the questions, and maybe we can discuss that later. Would you use NetSpeak in subtitles tomorrow? And uh, wh under what conditions will you use this sm uh, smiley, emoticon, pictogram, and so on tomorrow? If and when the you know that young people are used to that kind of language. Okay? Now I see three possible issues or answers. But again, I told you that I don't have any clear answer. And I come to the end of my presentation because I don't want to keep the floor too long. I want to discuss that more. There are th I, I see three possibilities, or at least now. You can, take the co you can consider the problem of this, um, how do you say, net speak, as a, as a matter of diglossia, what we talked last year too, as a kind of bilingualism, language variation, okay? And then you, you cope with that. But I don't believe that we are facing only a sociolinguistic matter. I think it's also a marker of difference between generations. And the young people want to be different than some other generation, like any kind of young generation, with a certain language. If that certain language became, become conventional, they will reject it. So what will be the use to use this uh, net speak if sooner or later, when these young people are becoming older, they will say, this is not our language anymore, and because the new generation will use something else. So it's a, generation, a generational marker, I will consider it like that, not as a sociolinguistic differences or variation. That's one way to look at it. <clears throat> number two, or number two, uh, second possible answer. On the net today, you have a lot of films, and uh, yesterday I was talking about abusing subtitling, you remember? I, I said I will define it later on, I do it now. It means subtitling made by young people on the net, especially for animation films from Japan, but not only for that. And they don't, let's say they don't respect dominant norms and dominant conventions. They don't write the subtitling at the bottom of the screen necessarily, it can be in diagonal, it can be in big letters, and they can add notes of translators, which are not used uh, in the conventional and traditional subtitling, and so on. And they do that partly because the volume of films to be translated is increases, and not everybody can, and not uh, every translator can do everything. So the market is, the volume of translation to be to be done is increasing so much that amateurs or fans can do it and they don't ask to get paid, but they do it and they use their own language to do it. I think this is a challenging part for the so-called traditional translators. Do we do like they do because that's what they like or do we do what we have been used to do? And abusive subtitling I think is quite important and of course you have in the background of my questions the problems of the quality. But quality for whom? For what kind of audience? If the young people are watching these anime films on the net, they will consider what they see as quite good quality. But of course, for most of the viewers who are not used to these kind of things, they will say this is not good quality. And the third possibility and the third answer or kind of answer is a question of the role and responsibility of the translator and that will be the main point for me. I don't think it's a sociolinguistic problem. I don't think it's a question of abusive subtitling. It's all this situation, all this change force us to ask again the question of the role and responsibility of the translators when doing subtitling. And I think there is a very tricky thing. Uh, nobody has ever been asked to do two translations of, let's say, 
William Faulkner at the same time. But today you can be asked to do two subtitling, one for the public TV and the other one for the commercial TV. And both TV broadcasting companies have different aims. And for the same kind of programs, you might be doing two different types of subtitling. The public TV will ask you, because they believe that they are educating people, they will ask you to do something more related to the standard, to the language norm, what you are used to. And the commercial TV will say, I don't care. Do what the people like. And if they like pictogram, use pictograms. So the question is very simple. Are we becoming more and more schizophrenic as a translator? Because uh, we have to work differently with different strategies and maybe with different language norms in different situations. What is our role and what is our responsibility in that case? To what exchange, to what extent, sorry, to what extent the translators is part of the language variation, language change? How far do we go? Do we go to the SMS net speak, believing that it's part of the language change? Or do we try to keep the language norm, the language dominant norm as it is today? And I think this is a quite important. It's not easy to answer. And I don't think it's a question of money, because of course you have to work for money every day. But it's a question of so a little bit to look at your role in the society. It's not only to get money for your own sake, but also yesterday people went to school to learn languages. Maybe they read newspapers to keep language norms, but I think today the language variation, the language norm is more